important. A lot of people on the left don't think that's true. So I'll start with Hegel, who once said, if theory and facts disagree, so much the worse for the facts. Today we'd say narrative in place of theory. Nietzsche did him one better when he said, there are no facts, there is only interpretation. And that may be the birth point uh, of what we nowadays call sometimes too sloppily postmodernism. Uh, uh, but, you know, you get to the modern age, and especially if you go deep dish Foucault, uh, you know, there is radical subjectivity is the core of postmodernism. The idea of objectivity itself is denied and called into question. Everything is socially constructed. Uh, now, I think, by the way, Foucault's ideas on power are serious and worth taking in, but pro tip, never go full Foucault, and that's what too many of his third-rate followers, I think, do, and I think they do great damage to the left. A good example of this was 20 years ago, the New York uh, University physicist Alan Sokol sent that nonsense article to Social Text, a prominent postmodernist journal that said, he's a physicist, right? Even the world of physics is susceptible to social construction. And they printed it without change, right? I mean, the journal should have folded up then out of embarrassment of the sheer stupidity of that, but they didn't. And, you know, I can point you to dozens and dozens of journals like this. Uh, so here's my point about the ruckus over alternative facts. We can say more about how facts are handled and all the rest of that. Uh, but this is a problem that was created by the left. And so the Trump administration, I think without thinking it through like this, has simply said, oh, all right, if that's the way it's played, here, have some of this. And so I don't see what the problem is. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to speak here at the Conference of World Affairs. This is my second year, and, and this is really, really a delight for me to be amongst people with uh, such diverse backgrounds uh, and, and that view the world through different perceptions. Uh, and, and, I, and I'm going to speak a little bit about the perception with which I view the world and, and this topic here today. Um, most of my life, I've been a national security uh, professional. so. I view the world from a national security, through a national security lens. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about uh, how I view those facts. Um, and um, in 1976 uh, was my first job in law enforcement. I was sworn in uh, in the Old Lyme, Connecticut Police Department. Uh, and, and that was an era I grew up watching uh, Joe Friday from Dragnet talk about just the facts, ma'am. And it was always a ma'am he talked to. Maybe that's why when I get into law enforcement, I don't know. But it was just the facts, ma'am. Uh, and, and my father was a police detective, and I wanted to be a detective and investigator. Uh, an investigation uh, is described as a systematic inquiry, study, scrutiny, research, and analysis to learn something. I'm currently a, a, a consultant, and when people ask me, uh, what type of consulting do you do, I tell them knowledge development. Uh, what I do is try to help a, a client develop knowledge about a particular topical area based on my experience uh, as a national security professional. Uh, and, and so through my career, whether I was running a criminal uh, operation, a counterintelligence operation, a counterterrorism operation, uh, interviewing a witness, conducting a crime scene, working undercover, interrogating a suspect, it was always trying to develop knowledge and determine what those facts might be to give them to a decision maker to make an informed decision. That, that, that decision maker might be a prosecutor, it might be a commanding officer trying to make a decision whether a port is of such a high threat level the Navy can't sail the ship into it. Uh, but whatever it was, the job was to collect facts and do an analysis for an informed decision. Uh, so, so facts are critical for decision makers uh, and, and for me, uh, I was kind of taken aback by the title because for me, there is no such thing as an alternate fact, an alternative fact. There's truth, there's varying degrees of misrepresentation, falsehood, and lies. Uh, I, I, I've lied quite a bit in my career. <clears throat> I've, I've worked undercover. My job was to lie to people. My job was to manipulate their perception so that they believe I am something that I am not to accomplish an objective for a governmental purpose. Uh, and, and so uh, what I'm seeing now is calculated and intentional lies of the public to manipulate your perceptions to achieve a certain outcome that someone else has determined. 
Uh, and, and this has been done through history. Uh, if we look back at uh, Adolf Hitler, uh, a, a populist leader at one point, uh, who wrote Mein Kemp. Uh, let, 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 me, let, let me read a little bit from what he wrote in that publication. In the big lie, there is always a certain force of credibility because the broad masses are always more easily corrupted in the deeper strata of their emotional nature. And thus, in the primitive simplicity of their minds, they are more readily fall victim to a big lie than a small lie since they themselves often tell small lies, but would be ashamed to resort to the large-scale falsehoods. It would never come to their heads to fabricate colossal untruths, and they would not believe that others could distort the truth so infamously. Let me move forward to another leader, Donald John Trump. And, and, and if you read his book, The Art of the Deal, if he wrote it, uh, what, what, what the art of the deal said, he said in that book was, the final key to the way I promote is bravado. I play to people's fantasies. People may not always think big themselves, but they can still get very excited by those who do. That's why a little hyperbole never hurts. People want to believe something is the biggest, the greatest, and the most spectacular. The press are always hungry for a good story, and the more sensational, the better. If you're different or you're outrageous, the press will write about you. Bad publicity is better than no publicity. Controversy, in short, sells. So, 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 so let me tell you my perception of that as I've developed my knowledge based on my training background and experience and my analysis of what I am seeing happening right now uh, in our country. Um, within my experience in counterintelligence, in the trade craft we call, uh, there's a thing called perception management. And, and, that, and that is, and my job as a counterintelligence officer was to try to, to, try to counter that from hostile or foreign intelligence services. And, and perception is the process by which individuals select, organize, interpret the input from their senses to give order and meaning to the world around them. Tradecraft, we have something called perception management. Some of you may, may hear about psychological operations, psyops, propaganda, disinformation, information operations. Ambiguity and social status are important influencers in managing someone's perceptions. Uh, the US and our democracy, we were victims of a hostile intelligence service information warfare campaign. And, and I believe that Donald Trump and the American public uh, their, their perceptions were managed to achieve a certain outcome that a foreign government, particularly Russia, Russia had wanted us uh, to, to achieve. Uh, to me, that is why facts matter. There are, there are no alternatives, and our democracy depends upon it. Thank you. Hi. Um, I am co-creator of The Daily Show. And so, <laughs> it, we used to be the fake news. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, as, as a comic and a political satirist, um, it's my job to be the skeptic. So I, I feel like through humor, what I like to do is when, when all of these people present their analysis and their alternative facts and their real facts, for me, I like to give people the benefit of the doubt and present to them through humor if something passes the smell test. You know, I think that so often people forget when, when we created The Daily Show back in 1996, it was a very different landscape. There was no Google, there was no YouTube, there was no, we used LexisNexis. Our staff got 40 newspapers from around the country and we divvied up the country based on what people were reporting on. And so to watch things be manipulated so fast and so furiously is something that is ever changing and it makes it easier, I think, to put something out there and then let it run wild. And so, 
Um, as Kellyanne Conway so aptly coined the phrase alternative facts, I think people forget that Kellyanne Conway's career has been based on promoting alternative facts. Uh, before Kellyanne Conway was working for Donald Trump, she worked for Ted Cruz. Kellyanne Conway was the spokesperson for Todd Akin, who, if that's a name you don't remember, Todd Akin was the Missouri <laughs> congressperson who said that women can't get pregnant if the rape was legitimate. <laughs> and Kellyanne Conway took that to the streets and ran like wildfire, <clears throat> creating the concept of legitimate rape and saying that women had some ability to turn sperm into something else. I don't, it's not true. <laughs> if, if we could, it would be scotch or ranch dressing or something that people enjoy. Um, so often, I think, when you look at alternative facts, if, if the fact doesn't bear out, that's a good indication. And then what my job is, is to, when eventually your alternative fact becomes a goose egg, to then relentlessly shame the person who decided to promote it. Um, but I think that when we, when, we, when we muddle up the waters of who's doing research, who's actually doing good reporting, who actually is looking at facts, um, it feels really scary to me. It feels like if I don't have a trusted source, I can't, how do I satirize anything? anymore. And so when the satirists are often the people who are sort of the bullshit barometers, if you will, um, and the barometers have been mucked up, it, it feels to me like we're in a whole new place. And so one thing I wish that we would all be doing is renting the movie Gaslight and re-watching it with people because when you see how somebody can make you not believe the evidence that you know to be true by denying it, that's a really weird place to be. Um, and so I think that as we talk about alternative facts, um, I don't believe, I am very much in your camp, there are no alternative facts. There's just ways to make people disbelieve things that they know to manipulate a game that is they're too lazy or weak or ridiculous or evil to actually work at trying to prove why their theory would be the best one to follow, or that their legislation would be the best one to follow. Evolving facts? Um, I don't really know what that means. Um, I can tell you that evolving facts can mean something was introduced, and then new evidence was reintroduced, and then that's just a new fact, I think. So I don't think there is evolving facts. So I think in the course of when we look at where we're at and who to believe and how to form a, a legitimate um, moral compass, um, my job is getting harder, but I'm, I am committed to forging ahead to make sure that I can parse out reality and fiction and marginalize those who decide to promote the fiction. Hello. Well, I do have a problem with alternative facts. And in fact, I have a problem with understanding the whole Trump phenomenon and how he gets away with it. And uh, I was having a terrible time understanding why Trump did not crash and burn during the long uh, campaign, and even, and, and even through the election, when against the uh, predictions of observers and, and my own good judgment, I thought. And the fact that I missed something really disturbed me. So I'm, I'm looking for sources to explain how our alternative facts have gotten such a, a free ride recently. And I've found three sources. First is Donald Trump himself. Second is Carl Jung. And I warn you, that's going to be a little heavy. <laughs> and the third is George Orwell. Now the first, Donald Trump, I'd like to quote from The Art of the Deal. And I quote the president. He says, I play to people's fantasies. People may not always think big themselves, but they can get very excited by those who do. That's why a little hyperbole never hurts. People want to believe that something is the biggest and the greatest and the most spectacular. You've heard this before, right? 
biggest and greatest. He says, I call it truthful hyperbole. It's an innocent form of exaggeration and a very effective form of promotion. Well, there you have it. There is the path from truthful hyperbole to alternative fact. The path is slippery and short, I would submit. OK, here's the second guide, Carl Jung. And it comes uh, from my, my approach to Carl Jung, comes through my old college roommate, Dr. Tom Singer, who is a Jungian psychiatrist, who's written a fantastic book called The, the Clear and Present Danger, Narcissism in the Era of Donald Trump. Now, Singer says, and this really helped me overcome my, b b b my b b bewilderment and my uh, insecurities about what, what I was missing in this Trump phenomenon. He says it's not about uh, Trump as it is about the people or a large group of people in this country. And from this perspective, he says, the elephant in the room turns out not to be we the people, turns out to be we the people of the United States, or at least a large number of those people. Okay, the Jungian analysis of alternative facts goes like this. Alternative flag facts flow from archetypal facts which reflect the collective psyche of the group self. Now, I warned you this is gonna be heavy. And it, it sounds like gobbledygook, but it's a gross simplification of the Jungian analysis. But Trump was able to connect with the woundedness of a substantial number of Americans who feel cut off from their inherited and natural birthright as American citizens. And he quotes a description of an interview with a respectable, non-racist, middle-class woman where the reporter asked the woman why she was supporting Trump. She says, I want my country back. Now, what does she mean by that? Now, we can easily imagine this woman clicking through the TV news channels and websites and encountering this montage. Black Lives Matters protesters bullying the latest object of their ire a lesbian couple kissing at their wedding ceremony, a uh, Chicago mother weeping over the death of her young daughter, uh, struck by an errant bullet from a gang shootout, a panel earnestly discussing the need for men who identify as women to have access to public laboratories of their choosing, and college students railing about imagined psychic injuries caused by their professors and fellow students. Well, this woman's not a racist. She wants her country back. And in the Jungian sense of the word, she's also suffering ex ex extinction anxiety. That's extinction anxiety. But why would she be willing to support a candidate as manifestly unqualified as Trump? And why would she be able to overlook the obvious falsity of such a profusion of alternative facts? One reason suggests our Jungian was Trump's political genius to, to launch his campaign with an attack on political correctness. Singer says that Trump sensed that political correctness could be the trigger word to unleash potent levels of what the Jungians call shadow energies that have been accumulating in the cultural unconsciousness of the group psyche of a large group of people in this country. And Trump's willingness to be politically incorrect became a sign of his own truth telling to many. And he embodies the truth of the shadow side of political correctness that seems to be the primary truth that core followers care about. So once Trump has spoken their, to their emotional truth, the Trump faithful no longer care about other truths or, or non-truths. Cultural complexes don't need to rely on facts to validate their particular perspective of the world. And if it feels right, it must be so. And says Dr. Singer, it's characteristic of cultural complexes that facts are just the first thing, just about the first thing to go when an individual or a group suffers from a complex. Now the point has been made that fact-checking doesn't seem to bother the Trump base. And facts don't seem to make any difference to the Trump self-presentation. And this fits in with this theory, fortunately. Now one more mem from, from Dr. Singer. Some observers have played with the notion that Donald Trump is some sort of a twisted image of the great American poet, Walt Whitman, who is the ultimate bard of the American spirit. 
And there is a surface similarity between the way Trump acts and what Whitman says about himself in these lines. And I quote, do I contradict myself? Very well then, I contradict myself. I'm large, I'm multitudes, end quote. Trump is so large and powerful, he doesn't have to be predictable. He can change his mind if he wants. He can lie if he wants. Whitman also wrote this mystical vision of, a vision of America as he compared himself to a spotted hawk who soars above the sacred land. And I quote, the spotted hawk swoops by, accuses me. He complains of my gab and my loitering. But I, too, am not a bit tame. I am untranslatable. I sound my barbaric yark over the roofs of the world, end quote. Yark is a wonderful word, isn't it? <laughs> Trump didn't invent it, neither did uh, Whitman. It's an old English word, but, but uh, Whitman didn't make it famous in this poem. And Trump echoes these sentiments as he proudly presents himself to the world as untranslatable. And he too shouts his own barbaric yark, Y-A-R-P, Y-A-W-P, over the roofs of the world. Trump's barbaric yark get him out of here, make America great, may sound tinny in comparison to those who came before him, such as Whitman, Ginsburg, Dillon, Hendricks, and many others who have tapped into the great prim primal energy that's essentially American. But as Dr. Singer says, at great risk, one would too quickly discount the fact that Trump also has his own instinct for the primal source of American barbaric enthusiasm. Well, I called up my friend, Tom Singer recently in San Francisco and asked him how I, I thought things would end with, with Trump. And he says, and he, without violating his canons of professional responsibility where you're not supposed to diagnose a patient without actually talking to him. <laughs> he says, it's gotta be hell for Trump to be, uh, actually be president. The stress of being under that kind of scrutiny that he's never experienced before will take its toll eventually. Anyway, we one can hope. <laughs> anyway, on the issue of double speak briefly, no better guy than George Orwell in 1982, who wrote uh, 1984, whose books, by the way, as you probably know, are flying off the shelves. And his film has been reviewed uh, recently by thousands. Anyway, he has a, a wonderful, uh, a wonderful quote that I just want to end with here. And uh, this, this goes to the fact that uh, if, you, if, you, uh, if you abandon facts, this allows individuals and groups to accept truth and li as lies, and lies as truth. Anyway, I quote Orwell here. The Ministry of Peace concerns itself with war. The Ministry of Truth with lies. The Ministry of Love with torture. The ministry of plenty with starvation. These contradictions are not accidental, nor do they result from ordinary hypocrisy. They are deliberate exercises in doublethink. For it is only by reconciling contradictions that power can be retained infinitely. In no other way can the ancient cycle be broken. If human equality is to be forever averted, if the high, as we call them, are to keep their places permanently, then the prevailing mental condition must be controlled in sanity. Well, I think that's where our alternative facts leads. And I hope that we can, uh, we can short circuit that, uh, that, 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 that path. So I want to ask the panelists if you have any comments of any other panelists' uh, introductions and if you want to have any conversations about some of those points. I, I have a question I'd like to ask Liz. Uh, you know, if, if you look at satire, uh, humor, uh, in your background, I mean, the outrageous seemed to be what sold. George Carlin's Seven Dirty Words, whether it was Don Rickles, that, that quick-witted insult. Uh, Reality now is just so outrageous. How challenging is that now to your profession to, to, to try to, to wade through that to find something even more outrageous or shocking to get humor out of? I'm thinking of leaving and joining the church. <laughs> um, Did you pay him? 
after that setup. I know, right? <laughs> I think, you know, it is always, it is always the part that's very terrifying because I think um, it was so interesting to me that when Jon Stewart decided to leave The Daily Show and um, p people went into a collective panic, what's going to happen to the show? Oh my God, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And I got really mad because I thought, why weren't you this angry about the dereliction of your actual media, right? It's not Jon Stewart's job to actually be the truth teller. It's his job to be the comic who responds comedically to the best parts of the news that you can really parse out. You know, if you'll notice, like when you watch The Daily Show, it, they didn't really do deep dives into, or don't, into like how to solve the problem in the Middle East or some, because those things are really hard and nuanced. But to break down other things, sure. But it was like, they were angry that their, their beloved comedy show that they were getting the truth and the news from and actual facts um, may be twisted instead of being outraged that since you know CNN literally would be reporting on the fact that there was negotiations on whether or not we were going to go to war in Iraq and then go to break from that segment with a giant graphic that said countdown to the war you're like what is happening here what you know so like when you talk about alternative facts it's not a new thing for me it's the thing that it was the catalyst to create a show to respond to when we were the places that we were supposed to believe and get the information was happening. So it is really hard and it's kind of, um, it, it's difficult, but you have to stay on top of it. And I think what, what's happened is instead of going bit by bit, because every 15 seconds there's some crazy ass thing that happens, it's now become sort of following a pattern and then satirizing the pattern of somebody. Um, but one thing that I wanted to talk a, a statement that you made about um, everything being socially constructed possibly as a theory, humor, I think, totally erases that because it is one of the things that you can't, if somebody makes you laugh, that is an involuntary thing, right? You can't like pretend it's funny. You can't be conditioned to think something's funny. It is a guttural emotional thing. And so I think that with that statement, I think humor, it's, it's A, what connects us. So you and I have already laughed with each other twice, right? We might have disagreeable things on, on concept, but if someone is good and authentic um, and you can make them laugh, there is, a, there is a place to at least like that person, and I think that is crucial as we go about where we're going. Can I weigh in on that? Um, this may disappoint some people, I don't know. We're gonna end up close to heated agreement on this point. Oh, um, no. That uh, satire is actually, perhaps, uh, your kind is actually a superior take on the. I mean, why does humor work for a minute? I'm sorry, I mean, this is your territory. I shouldn't do this, but it's because you instantly know without having to think about it what the disharmony is, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I actually use this with students in the classroom. The famous test answer of someone said, Sir Francis Drake circumcised the globe <laughs> in a 100 foot clipper. <laughs> right? See? You don't have to puzzle out what's gone wrong there, right? So, so uh, yeah. So my complaint about uh, uh, you know alternative, I mean that particular phrase is I think you know if you'd had say rival facts or additional facts or a different set, maybe not so volatile. But um, no, my volatile. my complaint is exactly the same as yours, which is that the treatment of facts or statistics by the news media is so appallingly superficial. I don't care which cable network you're on. So a quick story. Uh, it's about 10 years ago now. I used, to, I used to do a lot of those cable TV shows, CNN, CNBC, so forth. Uh, I get called by Bill O'Reilly's producer at Fox, and they want to have me on a segment on energy. I taught energy policy and worked on it. And the conversation doesn't go very well. And by the way, the way these things work is the producers are in a hurry. They want to talk to you fast because they've got a show to put together an hour or two. He's har sexually harassing people, you know. Well, I just, you know, I didn't... I was not going to be in his studio, sadly. I was going to be remote, right? But. And, uh, but what was interesting was is they kept wanting me to pigeonhole me to say a particular thing. A lot of those segments you see, by the way, are actually scripted. They know what you're going to say. They actually tailor their questions to ask you. It's, it's, and, and then right, they go out of the segment and you go, that was useless. Anyway, so we're going back and forth. And I finally say to the producer, it says, it sounds to me you're not looking for someone who can analyze the news with some expertise. You're looking for someone to play a part. Mm -hmm. And the guy pauses for a long time and says, we'll get back to you. <laughs> Never heard another word. Now, the second half of this is uh, quicker. Uh, the next day, I had a phone call from another producer about energy. It was about some, Dick Cheney, some things he'd said. And I talked for almost an hour with this person. 
And it was all about, what, how do you really understand this story? And what's really the ins and outs of it? And all the rest of that. Well, guess what? Producer for The Daily Show. And they ended up, by the way, they were calling me for one of those rolling segments where I make you look like a fool. And they said, I don't know if you watch. Yeah, I know what you do. I'd play along. You guys are geniuses at it. It's great. And, but the point is, is I ended up thinking afterwards, and I've told this story to students, why is it that I had a more intelligent conversation about the nature of the story with a producer from a fake news show than from a real one? I know. Right? And, and just to, the conclusion is, is uh, you know, we, nobody reads Walter Lippmann anymore, but we do still read Will Rogers and Mark Twain. Mark Twain saying Congress is America's only distinctly criminal class. That was 150 <laughs> years ago, right? Uh, it's because uh, satire can penetrate more closely to the truth of things. And so that's why I was like the show, even if we have a different yeah. ideology. And if it's good, and that's the whole thing, is that it was, a, it's a very, it was a very, it's a very big tenet of the show to know what you're talking about um, so that you can indeed satirize it. And a lot of the people who work on the show came from, they were disgruntled news people, they were researchers, they were people who actually cared. And so when you see a segment, like one of my favorite segments ever on The Daily Show was, it was George Bush debating himself. <laughs> and it was literally, but you had to have those news nerds who are terrible in interviews, by the way. I mean, when people are really smart and they're like not good, at, they don't know how to suck up. So I don't care, I don't want you sucking up. If you're in my office and I'm producing a TV show and you're telling me that you like my shirt, no, get out of here. Why aren't you researching? I don't need you. So, um, <clears throat> no thank you, it's because my hair is terrible underneath. It's not a fashion statement, it's my roots are like that. I'm just gonna be real honest. Um, so I think you're right, and I think that it matters when it's smart and it's interesting. And you know, there was a study done um, that people who don't watch any news at all are smarter than people who watch Fox News all the time. Like they literally <laughs> passed a quiz better. So I think that's so interesting. I'd like to weigh in here a little bit. Uh, you know, uh, I, I, I also think that humor is absolutely crucial in this, uh, in this equation. In fact, Saturday Night Live is probably the best uh, truth teller in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the country today. But I think that's a little scary, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> when, 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 when our comedians are the people who have the custodian of the, of the real facts? Anyway, uh, let, 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 let's, let's be sure that we're... Uh, you know, we're, 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 we, we have some, some, some James Restons and Walter Lippmanns still left in the world. Maybe Tom Friedman, but he's fading. Anyway, that's my thought. Well, once we have self-driving cars, Tom Friedman will be out of business because he will have no more taxi drivers to talk to for his lead. I want to remind you all to text in questions if you have them or put your hand up and we'll come around and have you write that down on a sheet of paper. And um, I just want to just, just button that point and that is I think part of the problem that you hope that, or I hope anyway, that through humor and introducing a concept um, that people then will want to dig deeper. And I think part of, I think what the dis, I'm not going to, disservice is the wrong word, but I think sometimes the role that the, um, that the satirist or the comic can play is kind of anger fluffer, right? Where you get people involved, you get their emotions up, and then if there's not a call to action to do something or a place to look further and go deeper, um, it drops itself and it, it, can, it, has a ten it has a potential to become create cynics, right? Rather than create proactive people who really want to learn more and become the best citizenry they can be and fight for the beliefs that they believe in. And so I think that always, um, which is one of the reasons that I, I left from The Daily Show and, and other media ventures to actually run a nonprofit that combines all this, is that I can say to people, if after hearing this, this is making you feel enlightened and what can you do, here's some things you can do. Can I, can I just uh, make a, to having agreed with you uh, and still do, but I do want to issue a challenge and have you respond to something. Um, I should have found it. I meant to do it and bring it along in case this came up. I remember an article, more than one actually, five or six years ago, and it was from somebody somewhere on the left who was complaining about The Daily Show. Maybe you remember some of these. And it was, uh, yeah, and it was, well, they're making light of the news and they make people cynical and they make people not take it seriously. I thought that was completely wrong, but I wondered how you all responded to those kinds of critiques from people who would otherwise you might think would be friendly to you. I think, I know. <clears throat> 
Well, I think what it goes back to is the thing that I found the most fascinating when we launched The Daily Show is one of my hopes was that the media would look at itself and go, oh my God, we're just really bad at this. What have we become? And instead, what a lot of cable news did was say, oh, we need funny graphics. It's like, no, that was not the point to say you'll get more ratings if you get funny graphics. The point was we're pointing out because the media is as big of a character in the show as any media maker in it, right? Holding them up to a mirror as well. And so I feel like the media should have, instead of writing articles that the comedy show is being a comedy show, and I'm mad about that, why don't those people actually do the work, do the research, become the investigative journalist? If you're screaming that the comedy show isn't fulfilling every role that you would like it to fill in a, in a media landscape, you have serious problems. And you should, again, goes back to what I said, go complain and say what you want out of your media. And maybe advertiser-driven media isn't the way to have a media. I have a question for Mark. I don't know a lot about this issue, and I'm not sure it's possible to know about the issue. But the allegations that the Russians um, interfered with the last election, including um, hacking computers, which um, obviously would be a very sophisticated uh, interference and then also would require f sophisticated tools to determine that they did it. Um, Trump supporters are saying, well, that's just evidence that the Obama intelligence agencies are saying, let's see the evidence, if the evidence is secret or from the intelligence agencies, they can't see the evidence, so they're saying there is no evidence. How do you handle that situation in terms of what's factual? Yeah, uh, happy to answer that one. I worked for the U.S. government for 31 years. I did not work for an administration. I worked for a government. When we enter on duty in that government, we raise our right hand and we swear an allegiance. It is an allegiance to protect the Constitution of the United States from all enemies, foreign and domestic. Uh, in Al-Qaeda, they pledge allegiance to a person. They pledge bayat to, to, to a bin Laden, to a Zawahiri, uh, to a Baghdadi, Abu Dawa, uh, whoever, whoever their leader might be. But we don't, we don't do so. Uh, so so what, what you're hearing is someone trying to shape your perceptions uh, about what those facts actually say. Um, fr from my perspective and my experience, the evidence is clear and convincing that this was a hostile intelligence service information operation where, where they weaponized communication strategies to influence the outcome of our election because a weaker United States means a stronger Russia. I just have to say that I did really feel bad for the Russian ambassador because I think he must be in therapy like three days a week because no one ever remembers talking to him. <laughs> That's got to take a toll on your psyche just as a human. The Russian ambassador is a really nice guy, by the way. I, we, 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 I, I live in Washington and I talk, talk to him uh, a lot and I go to his embassy and and, and, and see his films. He shows um, old Russian films, which are, which are really fun to watch. But I'd like to say one thing about the, uh, the, the, the hacking. I'm not an expert on this, but I have read that the hacking of John Podesta's emails was not a sophisticated operation. It was something that a 12-year-old could have done and probably did, does. And so I think that, uh, uh, you know, one that needs to have some perspective on this Russian, uh, Russian attack business Sure, it's terrible, and we ought to do everything we can to stop it. But, you know, this is something that has been done, been, they've been doing in Europe for years, and, and, and we have been doing around the world for years. And so, you know, it's not necessarily an uh, uh, instance of first uh, impression here. Is advertising and corporate driven media a problem in truth telling? A hundred percent. I mean, you can't, it's, it's sort of like Donald Trump thinking that a businessman, having the qualifications of a businessman is the same as running a government that has three branches and all this stuff. It, it's like, you can't, when you're watching a news program and making money, 
is the bottom line, you know, profitability on the show, people forget that whether it's O'Reilly or Rachel Maddow, whoever, that nine o'clock advertising dollar isn't just about the networks that are news. You're competing with The Voice and, you know, the hot sitcom or whatever that's on at nine o'clock. So if you're driven to tell stories, I know that one of my early correspondents from The Daily Show um, left CBS News to work on The Daily Show because the edict at CBS News at the time was no stories about Native peoples or the environment because they don't rate. And so when you hear that, yeah, I do believe that there is definitely an influence that goes along with that. If Monsanto's sponsoring a show, you think you're gonna hear stories about GMOs? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like, to me, that's a no-brainer. Yeah, I, 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 would, I would like to add that, that what you have to appreciate is that uh, you are all manipulated daily. Mm -hmm. We are, you are, we are all very manipulable. And, and, and so advertisers every day try to manipulate your viewpoints to buy a product. And, and so there's a great book by uh, Robert Cialdini called The Art of Persuasion where he talks about these things of, of how, uh, how the advertising industry has used this uh, to, to take money from your wallet, to, to have you like Ford better than Chevy or one beer better than another or whatever it is or to advertise on a certain show, but, but it's to influence you uh, for your dollars. The difference here is the influence was, was about our democracy. And, and so, so while we as a government, we enter into influence operations as well as others, this time we were victimized by those and, and our democracy suffered because we did not have a, we had a process that was corrupted by an external influence rather than internal influences where candidates are constantly trying to manipulate you for your vote. This was an external influence for an outcome uh, that was in their favor, uh, not our favor. I have a question from Bill Califas online. Have the untrue claims in advertisement conditioned the public to accept political untruths? I'll take a stab, but I, I think I'd want to know some examples of what they mean by yeah. untrue claims in advertising. Um, I was w deciding whether to weigh in on the, the previous related question. Um, you know, there is an adage in marketing and advertising that half of all advertising is wasted, and the problem is telling which half, right? Um, it's good for agency billings if you're in the Mad Men business, right? Um, gosh, and the, it, there's an extensive literature in all this going back at least to Vance Packard's Hidden Persuaders in the 1950s, so this isn't a new theme. And I don't know, I mean, uh, I, let me sort of try and press it on to, I don't want to be pedantic about how this is one thing I think the Frankfurt School is actually right about, about the cultural and images and how it all swirls together, and that's a big subject. Uh, but let's go on to the lying part, because that's probably more, uh, I think the one question is, I'm gonna just pose this as a question, not give my opinion, but uh, the idea that we're just now waking up the idea that politicians lie to us, <laughs> this is news, this is not even fake news. And, and so the, the question here, and it's obviously been, I suggested, I think, a number of the comments made is, is uh, does Trump an order of magnitude beyond, or is he two standard devi deviations beyond a typical bell curve of politicians prevaricating? And I'm not sure how you measure that, but it seems to me that's the reasonable question. Well, I think, too, with Trump, there is the alternative facts that he puts out, but he writes, you both, you both re re quoted the same s spot in Art of the Deal, and I'm, I'm really glad that it was read twice because that is very important. And to lead people down a path of saying, you know, people want things that are bigger and better and greater, and historically how he treated the humans who got him where he is, and those are facts. The fact that he did not pay workers, the fact that people went bankrupt working on his projects, the fact that he has you know, a failed business, it, you call out a product, he's got a failed business to back it up, an airline, meat, all of it, right? And after saying all that, the fact that people look at him as a success is so interesting to me, and that success is based on really destroying the lives of the people who got you there. 
But of course, who made him a success? I mean, it was the news media. It was NBC putting him on The Apprentice. I mean, I think he owes his presidency to Jeff Zucker, now president of CNN, as much as anybody. I agree. He palled around with horrible celebrities who you wouldn't pay to go see do anything. It's fascinating. How has the abolishment of the fairness doctrine impacted how we now deal with facts? Uh, well, uh, okay, fairness doctrine. Uh, I, I was glad that the uh, FCC got rid of that back in the Reagan years. Um, I think if you still had the fairness doctrine, it would have caused problems for The Daily Show. Um, uh, I teach this case in the law classes I teach. The, the Fairness Doctrine was originally upheld by the Supreme Court in 1968 because the radio and TV spectrum was scarce. That's not true anymore. With the internet and cable and all the rest of that, there's no scarcity. If, that, if anyone tried to bring back the Fairness Doctrine today, I think the Supreme Court, would, there'd be a case brought up, the Supreme Court would strike it down right away. I think it had a very bad effect on media because a lot of media said, don't just avoid boring stories, but, but avoid doing controversial stories where we'll have to give equal time to the other side. Um, I, I think that you can actually adduce quite a lot of evidence to that. So I, I think actually getting rid of the fairness doctrine has been good for expanding the number of voices out in the media that we hear. But correct me if I'm wrong, and I'm more than willing to be wrong. Was part of the fairness doctrine how somebody, uh, or, or the entities that control the media and own the media, like you can't have so many people like owning the local paper and then uh, and the local news uh, station. Oh, is that, isn't those, that, is that part of that? Well, I can't that, remember. That rules to work. No, it was equal viewpoints, equal time for representatives of other points okay. of view. So to give you an example, um, when Ronald Reagan ran for president in 1976, they couldn't rerun his movies on any of the old movie channels because that would trip an equal time requirement. Uh, then George Takei, you know, the fellow from Star Trek, he ran for the LA City Council a couple of times back in the 70s when the Fairness Doctrine was still around. They couldn't rerun the Star Trek reruns that he was in because it would trip the Fairness Doctrine. That, I think, is really dumb. No, that's, yeah. As scientists, we accept that all findings are subject to further investigation. Has the evolving conclusions of science contributed to public cynicism about both science and politics? Um, I'll take a shot at that. <laughs> One of the uh, realities of, uh, of the situation here is that alternative facts sort of oversimplifies what a fact is and what a lie is. I think there's a tremendous spectrum toward between you know whatever pure fact is and whatever a pure lie is. And so I think that it, it is a it, it's a mistake for liberals to to think that it's such a, a, a black and white world out there in terms of uh, fact or, 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 or lies. I think that, you know, you, you, lies, you, you, can, you need to be able to recognize them and sort of like pornography, you know, you know them when you see them. But it's not a, uh, an open and shut case. And there are alternative interpretations and there are uh, 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 interpretive, uh, alternative visions. And there is development of facts. I mean, you know, uh, facts ch change uh, as, as in, in the scientific world, and I think that in, in, in the same thing happens with with opinions that that, that that sort of walk around looking like facts. Uh, I would also just say um, one example is I um, I do a lot of work in reproductive rights right now, and there is with the Neil Gorsuch um, nomination one of the things that has been profound in my movement was that he, when he was on the lower bench, um, ruled in favor of the Hobby Lobby case, which said that Hobby Lobby employee, uh, Hobby Lobby did not want to provide um, contraception that would act as abortifacients uh, to their employees, because it was against their moral beliefs. And citing Plan B as one of those things. Um, the science around Plan B, there's two interesting things about it. When the FDA um, approved Plan B, the science said that Plan B could stop a fertilized egg from implanting into the uterus. Um, that's actually been something that Plan B does just sometimes. What Plan B actually does is prevent um, ovulation, right? And so 
the FDA has not updated their website, which is crazy, but they should. Um, but you can't have an abortion if you aren't pregnant. And to have a lower court bring it to the Supreme Court and have a Supreme Court rule in favor of Hobby Lobby saying, ignoring the science completely, um, I think those are the kind of things that are problematic where we no longer even look at the science anymore. And even when the science of Plan B was incorrect, it was still true that you can't have a pregnancy unless you have a fertilized egg implanted into your uterus. Um, and yet, the science is just tossed out, and terms like life begins at conception becomes a basis with which we actually talk about how we legislate reproductive health when that is actually a religious term. It's not even a medical term. So I think that going back to the science is important on issues that are controversial and toxic, um, like, like that, and people have strong opinions based on their morality and their religion, um, how do we rectify saying your religious belief is not science, and when you look inside your soul, that's for you, that is not for me. When you look inside something for me, please look into a textbook. Yeah, and, and science is also uh, impacting uh, the public safety communities. Uh, as, as science has evolved, uh, and I'll talk about the physical science of DNA analysis. Uh, th that, has, that has changed the, the method and mannerisms in which that we would conduct a crime scene examination uh, because our knowledge has developed in such a way that, that we collect information differently to, to make an informed decision about an outcome. So, so that physical science has evolved. Uh, within law enforcement, uh, they know quite a bit about the physical sciences. They know about cavity expansion when a bullet hits flesh. They know about the speed of bullets. They study those things. There, there has been recent uh, a, an evolution of the behavioral sciences that are impacting law enforcement. And they're finding that, that things that they had believed in the past, uh, both in the investigative process and when they get to court in the judicial process, have evolved and the community has not yet uh, caught up with what the science says. Uh, and for instance, um, in the behavioral sciences, uh, uh, there's been quite a bit of research. Uh, there's been a hundred research projects since uh, uh, the, in a thing that I'm involved in, the high value detainee interrogation group research uh, program. And, and so we, we, we've done, uh, they've done, the government's done over a hundred research projects about uh, what it takes to elicit accurate and reliable information from a human subject. And, and so the, what the physical science of DNA has told us is that we have falsely convicted a lot of people for crimes they did not commit. So as that science has evolved, we have found that that, that has been the case. But what we've also found was uh, that people confess to crimes they did not commit. And now, when I was trained way back in the day in law enforcement, we were told, and I probably told people, an innocent person would not confess to a crime they didn't commit. That is absolutely inaccurate. That is, a, that is a fabrication, that is a false truth, an alternative fact. Uh, but at the time, that was what we believed because we were reinforced by the fact that we got a, sometimes, not all times, but, but sometimes occasionally we might get a false confession. And that was validated by the fact that a court would convict that person based on the false, con based on the false confession, not knowing it was false, obviously. And, and so, uh, you know, today I, I hear uh, judges give witnesses instructions about weighing the value of the testimony of a witness and, and, and to see if the witness's testimony is consistent. But what we find when we study memory is that when you tell the story a second time, your memory might evolve and the story might change. So the fact that you had inconsistencies in your story might be indicative of the truth, not indicative of deception, yet both our jury instructions and a lot of our law enforcement officers, uh, when you come through a border checkpoint, might be looking for indicators that you are being deceptive that are actually indicators that you are being truthful. So we, that needs to evolve even further uh, as we go along in the national security community. Question for Bill. So given the Jungian dynamic of unconscious drives or archetypes perhaps triggering
the support of Trump, how do you get through to his supporters then? Boy. <laughs> I don't know. We have to go back to Dr. Singer for this one, I think. But uh, no, I think it's a real problem, and I think that that's why this is a serious issue. Because once you, you're into the realm of the, the uh, collective psyche of a, of a large group of people, I think it's very difficult to change uh, change that. You, you, it's very difficult to change a psychosis in a person, an individual. Is, and, and, and when you have it going on in a group, uh, it's got to be it's got to be a serious issue. And uh, that's why I think uh, we should be concerned about this. It's not just a question of a one-off, uh, you know, bullying uh, misogynist who somehow slipped into the White House, but this is a, this is a real uh, societal divide that we have. And uh, so I think it's a very, very uh, serious question, and I think that uh, there needs to be serious thought given to how you, you bridge that divide. Um, I would just also like to add, saying that Trump supporters as some, like, lockstep mental unit is a really bad way to look at things. I think that people were very, um, I was a Bernie person, and then I was a Hillary person. But I'll tell you that um, one thing, like, Trump emerged because people are really, 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 really cynical about their government. Also, why Democrats didn't look at Jeb Bush's numbers, he never got out of a four-point place, to see that Bush fatigue, Bush Clinton fatigue is real. Um, those things are real. And the fact that Trump supporters, when you're a de in a desperate place to find any kind of desperate change, there's that wing. There's people who are certainly racist and horrible. There's the, there are those people that are real. There are, there are working class people who haven't had jobs since NAFTA happened, and they hold Bill and Hillary as a unit because they were proposed to be a unit. Whether you agree with like think those things are wrong, those things are real, and those things affected how people looked at and voted in the, in the larger scope of our political landscape. How do we change their minds on all those different things? I think that's a question, but I think that identifying what a Trump voter in northern Minnesota looks like versus a Trump voter in Florida looks like, those are, can be very different realities and addressing what they are it's why Bernie's economic message didn't necessarily resonate because he kept it so generic. When you are a brown or black person who comes from an economically dis disadvantaged place, your life experience is not the same as somebody who is a lower middle class white person. And to not say, I feel your pain, I know where you come from, I wanna learn about how to fix that problem for you, it's just all of those things make up the larger scope, I think, of where we're at. Let me just say one more thing about why, why I think it's so difficult to, uh, to change the Trump uh, uh, phenomenon. And that is, the Trump phenomenon, I think, is based on rapid change in society. And uh, where some people feel left behind or left out or just uh, uncomfortable with the change. And, and, and uh, you know, uh, if that change continues, I think we're, we're going to continue to see uh, the same sort of phenomenon. And, and I doubt that the, the changes, the pace of change is going to change anytime soon. Just weigh in quickly on uh, how you think about facts, something you said. Something that struck me in the primaries was in the states that opened primaries where you could vote for candidates of either party in either primary, I was struck by the number of people who turned up in polls, it was statistically significant, and the ones who told bewildered reporters, I can't decide between Trump and Bernie Sanders. There's a lot of that. What was that about? That was actually probably about some of the same facts. Mad about trade and certain yeah. things that both of them talked a level of generality about. TPP right? and NAFTA were things that Bernie right. stumped on a bunch and that right. Trump just said, and I don't even really think he understood what he was talking about. Yeah, well, that, yeah, sure. <laughs> but, but I mean, right. I think those yeah. things were huge. Yeah, right. Um, it, it, um, but as, as far as the, think of what you were saying, is, um, uh, look, he won by the narrowest of margins. And I don't even mean about the Electoral College wrinkle. What is 100,000 votes shifted and he would have lost. It's easy to lose those 100,000 votes. We'll say, just for the record, um, it's not the closest Electoral College margin. Uh, in 1976, 12,000 votes 
in two states, and Gerald Ford would have won the Electoral College. So this, this is the closest one we've seen. And everyone remembers 2000, the great train wreck of all time. But. There are a couple questions for you, Stephen, we, oh. if you feel like continuing. Um, someone takes dispute that um, an alternative fact was Obama's claim that you can keep your doctor, and they say that wasn't an alternative fact, but just a promise or a prediction that didn't come true. Some other uh, writers in here want to hear some more alternative facts coming from the left. And then one more question, being a person on the right, um, what do you want to say to the left to fix that problem? Wow, those are big questions. Uh, well, we did learn subsequently that Obama's own architect, it was not only if you like your doctor, you keep your doctor. If you like your health insurance, you can keep health insurance. We learned subsequently that his own architects of the policy knew that wasn't true at the time and actually tried to stop him from saying that. And I think he said it because, actually understand this, it makes perfect sense. Uh, Obama understood why Hillary Care had gone wrong in 1993-94 and was determined not to let that same problem derail Obama. I understand the politics of all that. Uh, remember Jonathan Gruber, who took a lot of heat. He said, it came out of tape, that the lack of transparency is actually a benefit to this, because you know, voters don't know what's going on. And right, that's, there you go. Uh, I think that was fairly messy business. I'm on a panel later on this afternoon on healthcare and what ought to be done. We'll talk more about the, the wonkery of it. Uh, the other question, I mean, what's the left do? That's a fun one. There's a, I, I did make brief reference to this. There's kind of a civil war going on on the left. I'm not sure I can describe this briefly. Uh, between, you know, the, you know, sort of like the postmodernists uh, and what I call sort of the old left that's still around. It doesn't mean necessarily old in chronology, but I mean the old, the old liberalism of, say, John Stuart Mill, John Dewey even. Uh, that's still very recognizable to someone like me as having a common frame of... Uh, of the philosophical tradition you can trace back to Aristotle. I would include people like Richard Rorty, the late Richard Rorty, Christopher Lash, uh, who, by the way, both of those figures in, some, in a certain way predicted the rise of Trump. Read Christopher Lash's book, this last one before he died, called The Revolt of the Elites. Describes exactly the way it plays out about you know, dislike of the Washington elites that exists on both parties. Uh, and then uh, Richard Rorty's final book, uh, Achieving Our Country, where he has these three paragraphs that you'd swear were describing Donald Trump book published in 1998. Um, so uh, that's, that's not very much, but I don't want to go on too long about that. But uh, there are, I think, uh, I mean, I slag the left all the time, but uh, there are a lot of credible voices and people on the left that I like a lot and respect a lot, even if we come down in different places. What are some accurate news sources? <laughs> the statistical abstract of the United States. Yeah, I, actually, I, I, I'm, an, I'm a news junkie because in, in my arena, I have to monitor what's going on globally. And, and what I find is an excellent news source is Twitter. If you follow the proper journalist, if you understand who to follow, it is an incredible mechanism for the collection of open source intelligence about what's going on around the globe. Now, you have to follow the right people. You have to understand it, it's through the lens that they view the world. Uh, but, but I find that, that social media can be a very, very effective means to cut through uh, things that are going on uh, that, that don't make it through uh, the lens of that producer who's doing the, the, the pre-interview of you. And, and, and so that can be a very good tool that you can use uh, to understand what's happening around the world. And I would say, yeah, follow people on the ground. I literally, on, on my Twitter feed, I, I follow people. I, categorize and parse them into like healthcare reporters. Um, if a news story is breaking in a, in a city or a town, immediately follow that town. Follow those local reporters because they are going to have sources, insight, they're gonna be at the scene and they're gonna be really helpful. So I would say Twitter is incredible and you can actually really make columns of people who are Middle Eastern correspondents. Um, you know, I mean, I'm a big fan of Democracy Now. Okay, sorry. I think it's an incredible news story. Yeah. No, I, I don't think there's uh, any single source that one can point to to uh, as sort of the uh, the Bible of, of truth in this world. I think you need a huge diversity mm -hmm. and uh, a mistake to, to think that you could rely on, on one, one, one or two uh, individual sources. There are a few questions here about students and education. 
So what are solutions and how do you teach students that have grown up in an atmosphere of social media that doesn't have a lot of controls on fake news or, you know, like biased media in the mainstream channels too? What, what's education, uh, what role does education play? How do we help young people to sharpen those skills of truth seeking? There is such a thing. Should I try this since I'm the practicing professor here? If I keep practicing, maybe I'll get good at it. I don't know. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I'm very old fashioned this way. Um, tell you quick, I, I've, I've gotten more, I, I can't hide anymore. Uh, but when I first started teaching at Georgetown 10 or so years ago, uh, one of the things that pleased me was about halfway through the semester, I would have two students, always two, because they needed to get their courage up, who would come and say to me, Professor Hayward, we can't tell if you're a liberal or a conservative, a Republican or a Democrat. And my first response was, well, they obviously haven't used this Google thing because they could <laughs> figure out in 10 seconds from any of my published writings. Uh, but then the second one was, no professor can completely conceal their bias. Um, but you should try to present things in an even-handed way, present the alternative points of view the way they would want to be presented by their advocates and not in some pejorative construction because you disagree with it. And I try very hard to do that. And so I was kind of pleased that it worked that. Now everybody knows. They come in the first day and said, oh, you're this right-wing extremist, and that's why I want to take the class. <laughs> Believe it or not, my progressive students like the class, my classes more than conservative students because I treat them with utmost respect. You sat in one of my classes, right? It was fun having you there. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and above all, the this is, I think, totally non-controversial. I'm almost embarrassed to say it. Not really embarrassed, but... You know, the object of any kind of education is not to teach people what to think, but how to think for themselves. And, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not going to pursue, you know. Um, and, you know, I think now the conservative critique of higher education is not so much, by the way, I had, I had some great radical professors. I really liked them. They graded me fairly. Our political arguments were outside of class. Inside the class was not politicized. And, and a lot of the education has become either politicized or what you get is groupthink because there aren't many people like me around on a campus to raise their hand and say, you know, there's an alternative, no, no, I don't want to say that. Um, <laughs> there, it's another way of thinking about the matter that, that you might want to think about. So uh, that's a very general answer, but I think it's the right one getting started. I also think too, it's so important whenever possible to travel and be amongst people. Lived experience can inform you in a way that is helps you bring in information that makes sense. The, 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 the smarter you are, the more experience you have with, with, with other dynamics, other points of view, other cultures, um, it allows you to create a smell test that makes sense and allows you to seek out um, information that will make sense to you. And I just think it's so much of the susceptibility to the alternative facts is that you do not have a point of reference that can that in any way, shape, or form gives you a bullshit meter, right? I mean, I grew up in Minnesota where um, the Lutheran Church, after the Vietnam War, sponsored Vietnamese, Laotian, Hmong, Cambodian folks in record numbers. There's more people in, the, the, I think the highest population of Vietnam, Vietnamese people outside of Vietnam is in the Twin Cities. Um, great Somali community in, in, in where I grew up. Um, I went to school with these kids. I, I knew them. And so um, when, I, when I hear something that is the exception made the rule about cultures, about people, about immigrants, about everybody, I can say, you have never been around somebody who's not like you. That is obvious. And so expanding that globally and providing those opportunities for people who don't have them, I think is going to be crucial in setting up, setting up positive space to bring in information. Any other quick comments about the education process from either Bill or Mark? Well, thank you all for the great questions you sent up here. I'm sorry if we didn't get to ask your question. Um, I ended up having a lot of them. We're going to conclude the panel because another one is coming in right now. Thanks again, and have a great conference on world affairs, and see you around. Thank you, presenters, too.